It's Tax FM 107.2 and you're here with Dwayne. We are actually very, very privileged to be joined by our Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Prof. Tuana Kupe. He's going to be talking to us just about the university responses. I had a little pre-chat with him um, and asked him, is he in good health? How's work and everything going? He's saying he's working a lot harder because he doesn't have the separate between like home and uh, work anymore. So he's finding himself working a lot, which is good because he says it has a lot of influence on how we deal with the matters, how we think, how we brainstorm. But he's in good health. He's doing well. And we're going to join the interview where we're busy talking about how the university responded to the not only just the government's uh, initial regulations and lockdown call, but the further extension. Take a listen to what Prof. Kupe had to say with myself in talking about the university's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Look in step with them. Publicly issued health regulations, including the WHO uh, regulations. So, so that meant that we couldn't have contact teaching anymore. And that meant that uh, we couldn't complete our, our first quarter. Remember, we actually days away from our first quarter. Yeah, yeah, we so were. Which, what we did then was to bring back the recess, but to also extend it. Because remember that also April is a difficult month in our lives anyway, without coronavirus it always is a lot of holidays it's always when we have a recess it's always when we also do our graduations so but now we need to actually begin to recover and resume our academic program and now that's what i was sort of getting into so um the the response from the university after the second announcement that the lockdown was going to be extended now we were going on to an online program what sort of um thinking was behind that process to try and get the continuance of the first semester? Well, the first principle was obviously that we, we don't want to totally lose the academic year. The pandemic is something that's global. It's beyond our reach. But always I believe that uh, for every difficult situation, there are some opportunities and there are some avenues of continuing. In West of Pretoria, is lacking that, as you know, we've always practiced for a long time now what is called hybrid teaching and learning where some of this stuff is, is online. It's not the primary mode. Our primary mode is still contact education, but it's very much complemented, enhanced, extended, if you like, by a presence online. 94% of our undergraduate courses, for example, have an online, significant online uh, 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 presence and presentation, if you like, so that you can find the course outline, embedded links, things that will guide you around. So we say that I think uh, you, you did refer earlier on as you referenced uh, Fees Must Fall earlier. Remember that during Fees Must Fall, one of the modes to continue teaching in those difficult days was to leverage on our online experience, which is not a simple thing in its own right because it has all sorts of issues of access, uh, which is differential because of the inequalities in our society. So we started working on a big plan to say when we resume, teaching and learning, if the lockdown is still on or the public health disaster or emergency is still on, how do you proceed in this regard? And also, this was not just UP only. This was something that was decided by the sector as a whole and also by the Department of Higher Education and Training. So right now, we poised towards actually a resumption of teaching and learning online. So with the online learning, obviously, as you highlighted, um, there come a few, there, there come a few sort of barriers and hurdles to online Absolutely, learning. Yes, yeah. um, so I think the one thing we noticed is that there were lots of speculations during fees must fall that when we went online, there was a significant percentage of um, failures that took place because some people not able to one adapt because they not only didn't have the resource, but it's a different style of learning to the usual contact learning that we're familiar with. And it caused students to not academically succeed because of that. But then also things like having accesses to resources like your libraries or just computers in general, interconnect connections. How is the university going to try and facilitate that that barrier becomes so, like solved? Yeah. Those, those barriers are, are, are genuine, but you also discover that between the last time, the first mass fall, 2015, 2016, the way in which online is being offered is much more developed and not saying fully developed. The barriers still exist. So one of the things we're using this time right now is to mitigate against that. So, for example, online, it's easy to like, load a lot of videos and so on, but videos can actually eat up on data. Yeah. 
they, some of them can, depending on where you are, the network is much slower and so on. So, and also just in forgetting UP, just in general, in this field of teaching uh, and learning online, people are beginning to learn what kind of videos and material to use, which is easy on data, easy to download, and the various modalities. I think you will see as soon as we resume that, that some lessons have been learned from that time. But remember that the, the, the barriers are not on one side. A student who has a device or even the university, has a, we depend on, on, on commercial networks and public networks for speed and of access and all of that. So what is also fascinating, I don't know whether you've seen on Instagram that the Javid, for example, is trying to show some of his art of yes, it is works yes. of art. So we now have learned that all of those things are actually possible. I think I can say that all of us are on a, on a learning curve in relation to the ease of how you can do things online. And this is, no, I'm not talking about students only. I'm talking about us as academics and as academic institutions as well. Now, how is the university still going to facilitate even those students who maybe don't even have devices to start with or don't have internet connections at all? Is there any yes. provisions the university is going to be making to assist those specific students? Yes, no, good, good question. As we speak right now, you and I, there's a massive operation in the procurement exercise going on as we, as we are speaking right now to buy devices for those students. Some have already actually been bought. Some have been the, 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 techn- the, uh, the buying process is, is speaking right on. But it, uh, let me put it this way. It's like somebody is in a supermarket right now pushing a trolley full of, of laptops, but I don't mean that in the literature. <laughs> but I mean, you, you get what I mean. Yes, right? and I understand. And then also another group of people is actually mapping out an exercise and an SMS going to go out to students who we believe need to say, where are you? We're going to partner with the South African Post Office because they are allowed under lockdown to deliver door to door. So then we also have done, I think you might have seen statements around zero rating of data, all of that so that students can easily access things. The challenge still remains on relation to your la- last point. Students without, it's fine to give me a laptop or a device if I don't have internet access. We're trying to get internet enabled devices, but some people might suffer a lack of electricity, remoteness yeah. of areas. That another group is working together with me while thinking of that. We have acquired, we have been given by MultiChoice, by the way, a channel to use for teaching and and as you are calling me now and i'm actually I hear my phone keeps on trying to ring i know who that is he's the chief executive of the sabc him and i are talking about also availing channel space on sabc so we could put stuff all of these things are not easy yeah but uh, the point i'm trying to say is that we are coming at it at different angles and not having the naive tunnel view that simply uh, everybody's inter is connected. Everybody's got a device. Yeah. So, so we uh, we are outlaid a lot of UA, UP resources, including creating a UP solidarity fund to raise money. And I see lots of questions coming my way. Where do I donate to the UP solidarity fund in order to 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 to, to try and get these things going? Yeah. So. My statement has just gone out to issue of your email. Yeah, yeah, I actually just saw my phone go off now. We'll, yeah. we'll touch on that sort of at the end. Um, yeah. Because we always, uh, and you mentioned it even at the, the, the top of the interview, we speak about how UP is often a forerunner and sort of likes to differentiate itself from other universities, but also acts in solidarity with them. Um, Stellenbosch recently released statements that there will be no financial and academic exclusions um, for students next year, um, uh, that, they, that they will be allowed to continue. Um, UP, uh, I mean, UJ recently, there's a boycott going on of the online lectures. How would UP respond to those things? Would they follow suit or do they have a different plan in process? Do we have to consider that all the universities have different demographics, different student bases, and that we have to respond individually to those needs? Yeah, I think your latter statement, but without excluding the, I mean, we just talk academic exclusions. This year, obviously, when you look at issues of exclusion, you have to be absolutely sensitive to what has happened. You can't do academic exclusions the way you did when things were normal. And, and, but also, one is not simply a, a huge blanket thing for a, a person. Let's say a guy like you and let me say you and me, we had all of the access and we decided uh, to lounge in bed. Yeah. And no, there's no evidence that we couldn't actually go and click up and do what we need. I mean, that actually was something we would do even when there was no pandemic. Yeah. But 
in, in general, the rules would have to be looked at very differently from when things were normal. We, that we would have to do. No, yeah. Uh, and but also at the same time, not allowing people who are taking advantage of the system. Because remember that your reputation depends on the quality that you. If and also if you are a student who's working hard and somebody is not working hard over there and they all they all push through, you begin to wonder what's going on here. Yeah. Well, why you need to work hard? I'm, I'm... So so so. But in general. We are going to actually have to look at the situation very, very different. Yeah. And also look at also financial implications and all of that. So I was going to talk about finances now because some students have obviously raised on social media, and it's a question I wanted to ask to you, um, that everybody's saying now that we don't have contact lectures and we're not coming to campus and we don't have access to the resources, would there ever be a, a level of our fees necessarily decreasing for the payment we're paying because we're not necessarily getting what we've been paid or what we've paid for? I mean, that has to be taken into consideration as well, but very carefully. Yeah. So remember, let me give you just one example. One of the largest costs of a university is the water, electricity, and it's not being used at the same level, right? Yeah. But the biggest cost that you invest, you know what, is salaries of employees. And I was going to get to that now, yeah. Yeah, we haven't retrenched anybody, right? Okay. And the university has three sources of income, government subsidy, student fees, and money we raise. Yeah. Between government fees and government subsidies and fees, we pay our salaries. Remember, we didn't retrench everybody, because if we did... Would have to re, to to pay them retrenchment packages, rehire them, and so on. So some very large costs still remain in the system, yeah. even though things are not being used. So, so let me put it this way: when I when I say that people might say he's saying you won't get any reduction, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you're going to get a huge reduction. So we're going to look at the situation carefully and say this cost really base was not incurred or pays to the same extent. But remember, what we must do is that, must know that post-COVID, we must have the same quality of university we had before, yeah. and for the future, we must have the same quality of university, because that is one of the distinguishing features of UP. Yeah. We get a quality education and quality infrastructure with quality staff as well. Temporary emergencies or sudden emergencies like this might be inconvenient financially, but don't think of the short term. Think of the long term yeah. as well. Because I was going to ask you about how our ground staff, assistant lecturers, security guards, and that's still being dealt with. But I think you've answered that question. So yeah, I can no, move no, to... We pay, yeah, yeah. We need to be short-sighted yeah. and also inhumane and cruel to simply just yes. say we're not paying you anymore. So Why I wanted to talk that, about yeah. now after the lockdown, because um, obviously with the online process in place and getting resources to students and getting um, the process online, people are worried about what the job sector will look at the degrees like, knowing that... Mm-hmm part of that degree was done online and whether that <laughs> they will question the quality of the education these students have received. Yeah, yes, no, 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 I think well, people might well look at it like that, but they should also look at the big picture. What happened here is uh, something beyond anybody's control and it's global. Yeah. It's, it's not something that happened to UP around the corner or TUT around the corner uh, or South Africa on Everybody globally is being impacted. Whether you're a Harvard student or a UP student, you have had to go online and not get the same full package you would have got if you're using both online or directly contact. So it's a matter of people having perspective as well. And I used to say during Christmas fall that we can't argue that the quality is necessarily the same, but quality is not also sometimes about quantity. Yeah. What's going to be interesting is what cause of the thing that need to be taught, whether they have been taught and the person is therefore knowledgeable or is able to acquire even through the work experience and others' knowledge. Sometimes I think because when we have all of the time in the world, we emphasize quantity and we confuse it for quality. Yeah. I think this situation might be forcing us to say, if you actually with this amount of time, what are the core things you would need to teach which would provoke somebody not to, 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 to have read books, but to be educated. Because those are two different things. Yeah, that's very to interesting. To read a yeah. lot and to be actually be educated and yeah. a thinking person is not the same. I've seen some people read all of the time, but they don't get it all of the time. And somebody who's reading strategically, quite smartly, in depthly, vertically, and horizontally, I mean, and they if, actually get it. Yeah. From my position, I, I personally, the way it seems like our online lectures in the law faculty are going are 
to have it more practical based writing actual notes writing stuff instead of doing tests which i've always necessarily been against um do you think that even that strategy now will move us into considering yeah, yeah, no, different forms of yeah, education the assessments yeah. Will, yeah the assessments are going to change as well and i think you you, you i like what you imply is that it's going to push us also to be more creative about assessments because you know you know you could claim read for a test yeah. and pass it but another innovative way of actually assessing whether you have got the content and its applicability depending on the discipline, it, it can be found, which is a better way of doing it. So when I used to teach, uh, I don't have uh, I don't have a chance now, given I took the wrong turn in academia, <laughs> in management, to teach. <laughs> but though, when at VC, I used to try and teach uh, when I could. And I was going to start teaching this year until this corona came. Yeah. Even if it's a few guest lectures. When I started the department at VC, I immediately, in 2002, I immediately said 50% of a person's course is, is, is not exams. Only 50% was exams. Yeah. And also, uh, uh, when I taught higher levels, like post I gave people a takeaway home. I said, come and collect it at 8, bring it tomorrow at 12 noon. And I said, you can open your books, I'm not invigilating you. But if you haven't been following the class and participating in debate and knowing things, even if I give you 18 hours, you're still going to fail. Yeah. <laughs> because learning is not about reading for the exam yeah. or for the test. So I also wanted to now just touch on, we we expecting, hopefully expecting to come back, um, in the statement even said, for second semester. So yeah. we expecting to come back and resume, co- resume contact learning, um, which you can obviously confirm. So, so, for, yeah, so for the second semester, we, we were expecting that pandemic will have resided usually there's no public health emergency and we can resume contact issue. but remember both you and i are speculating now yeah. when will the pandemic end but yes from a principal point of view that is the hope that is the desire that is the aspiration because my, my question then will be when we do resume will there be any if you have to give any foresight um obviously maybe the planning committees and that haven't sat down yet um probably you haven't sat down with prof stro and the rest of the executive as well um in terms of like resuming the biometrics in terms of us saying um how are we going to deal with overcrowded lectures how are we still going to enforce possible social distancing hygiene and all that kind of stuff is this now a prevalent concern on the university side yeah, yeah, to yeah. think no, about no, no, no. I think this is, you know, a situation like this makes is lessons to learn. And so you're quite right. We have put on our thinking caps around what would be public, what one should always think about pandemics. Of the, because I doubt that this coronavirus is the last coronavirus or other virus you can ever get. So obviously, if you don't learn from those lessons, you're really actually tough and tough. Yeah. So we're putting on our thinking heads by trying to deal with the immediate. But remember, you jump to the second semester. We still have to finish the first semester. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that is what my statement is about: is how are we going to finish? When and how are we going to resume finishing the first semester? Prof, you released a statement. I'm going to say today, but Friday, um, the 17th of April. Um, yeah. What specifically would you just want to clarify that people may miss from reading the statement that you just want to emphasize? Yeah. So, 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 so there's a new statement. We, oh, oh, you mean today is the yeah, 17th? Yeah, today's right? one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll fine. just put a date in I'm so that if anyone who listens to this afterwards, they can just know when the statement was released. Yeah, which I'm no, talking you're right about. about that. I'm also getting lost about dates and dates. Yeah. <laughs> so what we have decided to do is that knowing that we haven't, we've, tried, we've been working very hard, trying all our best, we haven't been able to get as many gadgets or if you like devices or laptops or whatever to, as to the students who might need them, that it would be unwise to proceed next Monday to start with teaching and learning online okay rather let's actually uh, put all our efforts into getting to do that and then we will resume uh, teaching and learning online now on the 4th of may 2020 okay the reason is that 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 we, we really must try and work together and move in tandem and you you know it yourself being a yeah. student yeah. when well, lecturers have to repeat things for others and others things get lost things yeah. get confused everybody gets tired everybody thinks that someone else is advantage and so and so is not advantage and also as we and i discussed it earlier on teaching and learning online is not easy uh, we are not used that's not the primary mode we are used to do it so we need to actually to buy ourselves some time to press also the following week the week of the 27th the first there's two public holidays in it yeah 27th is Freedom Day, 
the first is a, a worker's day. It will be a short week anyway. Let's start with a clean week. And also, let's also start when the lockdown, this extension of the lockdown has ended. Psychology matters. I mean, right now, people, I mean, I don't know, you, you talk to family and friends and other students, people are a bit down in spirit. Yeah because of this lockdown and the virus to start things that are to require concentration of the mind with that hanging over their head feels like some added torture doesn't it and, yeah. and doesn't feel really free people's minds to be able to focus so we went from all psychological language from a preparatory point of view as far as we can go from devices to those we can get to to have on board as many members of our community as possible okay I think that's an admirable response. Prof, I think that basically concludes everything that we needed to know in here. With any, yeah. From your side, obviously, um, being the principal and vice chancellor, any just words of advice, support, and just reassurance, not even just to the students themselves, but also to your academic staff um, who are now helping facilitate this process of ensuring uh, that UP retains its high standard of education? Yes, no, no, no. I think thanks for that. I think that I... UP people have resilience. More resilience is required of us. But also more kindness, more empathy, more working together, more being considerate is what is going to get us through, all of us, through this crisis. I think we're in it together. If the pandemic, the COVID-19, is not a creation of the university against the staff or the students, or it's not a conflict among ourselves. It's something that threatens all of us, that all of us should survive by simply being kind, empathetic, and working together. Okay. Thank you so much for all the insight and for joining us today, Prof. No, thank you very much. Have a, please stay safe, and then we look forward to all of us getting back together at the end of this. Yeah, stay safe too and take precautions. Thanks, Prof. Thank you. Bye. Bye.